It is a statement of fact that the first decades of the U.S. space program owed its success to Nazi Germany. The Americans recognized that it was Nazi scientists, engineers, and technicians that had first developed the vehicles to enable man to enter space, and had followed that possession of such personnel would be vital for any nation intending to build both a successful ballistic missile program and a space program, as both the United States and the Soviet Union immediately embarked upon at the conclusion of World War II in 1945. Both nations actively sought to capture Nazi rocket engineers and other scientists technicians and to have them work for them in the growing space race. And it is a fact that the US was more successful in persuading Germans to go to work for it than the Soviets were, who had to use threats and coercion to force ex-Nazi scientists to cooperate. For the Americans it was a lot easier. A special intelligence operation was launched to find and recruit Hitler's rocket personnel called Operation Overcast, later changed to Paperclip. Begun on the 20th of July 1945, an astounding 1,600 German scientists, engineers and technicians were shipped to the US, in the process having their wartime service records bleach clean of involvement in very real war crimes, and they settled into productive and lucrative work in well-funded US facilities joined by their families, honoured and often highly regarded guests of the US, and many later made US citizens. German scientists got America to the moon in 1969. This photograph, taken in 1962 at the Cape Canaveral Missile Test Annex, shows President John F. Kennedy and Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson. Sitting beside them are two former SS officer war criminals. These Nazis' hands were drenched in blood in World War II but today they are widely honoured by NASA and many other US entities, just two examples of America honouring Hitler's minions even in 2024. The problem with the Operation Paperclip personnel was traced to the men's activities during World War II. In order to push technology forward at such an astounding speed to give Hitler jet and rocket-propelled planes and cruise and ballistic missiles, tens of thousands of innocent people were deliberately killed. In the first place, the American homeland was not on the receiving end of the rockets and missiles unlike wartime Britain and elsewhere. The V-1, the world's first really effective cruise missile, was used in a bombing campaign against Britain between the 12th of June 1944 and the 29th of March 1945. During that time, 10,492 V-1s were launched to Britain to kill 6,000 people and injure a further 18,000. Over one million buildings were destroyed or damaged by V-1 flying bombs. Almost 2,000 flying bombs fell victim to Allied fighter planes. Of the 8,000 bombs launched, 2,300 penetrated British defences, most of them falling in the London vicinity. The propulsion roar of the flying bomb was easily identified and gave warning of the approaching blast. New deep shelters built for this emergency were put to use and saved the lives of thousands of people. At the same time, Britain was also being bombarded with the more advanced V-2 ballistic missile. The first artificial object to travel into space on the 20th of June 1944. The first V-2 fell on Britain on the 8th of September of that year, and the last on the 27th of March 1945. Between these two dates, over 1,400 V-2s hit England, killing 2,754 people and injuring a further 6,523. 
the British could never shrug off a distrust and dislike for the men who had built these weapons and used them in the name of Adolf Hitler against the United Kingdom, and who fell into British hands at the end of the war. Our own attempt to run a test program of V-2 rockets called Operation Backfire was short and very limited. As soon as they could, the Nazi scientists sought new employment with the far more friendly Americans. And there was another reason. Outside of the use of such weapons in acts of war, that turned many people's stomachs concerning the German scientists and technicians. The V-1 and V-2 were constructed in secret factories that used vast armies of foreign forced laborers and slave labor from the concentration camp system. The men building the rockets knew all about the misery these workers suffered and the appallingly high death rates caused by this criminal system administered by very cruel SS officers. The V weapons program ended up in the hands of Heinrich Himmler's SS and was run by SS Obergruppenführer Dr. Hans Kummler, a barbaric mass murderer who would step over thousands of dead bodies in order to keep the weapons coming and attacking the Allies. The scientists, far from being harmless apolitical boffins who just happened to work for an evil regime, brilliant men, years ahead of their time, tragically harnessed to an evil empire were actually fully paid up and often honoured supporters of Hitler's Germany, who accepted senior positions in the SS and medals from the Nazi state, despite their post-war protestations of innocence. So how many people died building V-weapons? at least 20,000, perhaps many more, which is actually in excess of the number of people killed in Britain by the V-weapons. Thousands more were found clinging to life and suffering from disease, starvation and overwork by the advancing allies that liberated the camps and the factories at war's end. But the paperclip scientists were exonerated from such activities of war crimes by the US government. No Nuremberg trial for them. The two principal Nazi war criminals that got Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin to the surface of the moon in 1969 were Werner von Braun and Kurt Debus. I'm not kidding when I say that as well as planting the stars and stripes in the barren lunar soil, Armstrong and Aldrin should also have planted the Nazi flag, for without a huge number of Nazis, it's doubtful that NASA could have made its great leap for mankind so swiftly a giant leap for mankind made over a mountain of human corpses, completely forgotten today, and as well in 1969. My issue is not that America used Nazi war criminals for its own ends. We all did, the Soviets, the French, the British, and so on. My issue is that in 2024, these unrepentant criminals are still so widely honored in the United States which is ironic in an America so busily re-evaluating and reordering its own history, such as tearing down Confederate statues and so on. It appears a very ambiguous position indeed. So let us briefly examine the two major war criminals America still chooses to honour. Werner von Braun was the leading figure in the development of rocket technology in Germany and a pioneer of the later US space program. A note here on the pronunciation of his name. Most Americans call him Werner von Braun, but his actual name in German is Werner von Braun. And in fact he was a baron, the middle part of his name containing the word Freiherr. So we have a Prussian aristocrat from a distinguished conservative family involving himself in some of the worst crimes of the 20th century. An opportunist, his early work with rockets won him the approval of the Nazi party, which he joined on the 20th of November 1937. Being a party member helped his career. Despite his post-war protestations that his membership of the party was some kind of formality, in fact, he received numerous letters of commendation for outstanding performance of duties during his time working under the Nazi party. By 1937, von Braun was also an SS officer. He had first joined the Allgemeine SS in November 1933, and in 1940 was commissioned as an SS Untersturmführer, or second lieutenant. Von Braun explained away his commission as being forced upon him by Himmler, who was trying to muscle in on the then-army run missile program. 
Von Braun claimed that he only wore his black uniform once during Himmler's visit to Peenemünde, where the rockets were demonstrated, but in 2002 a former SS officer colleague recalled that Von Braun actually wore his SS uniform at all official meetings. He was also promoted steadily through the ranks of the SS. In November 1941, promoted to Obersturmführer, or Lieutenant, November 1942, to Hauptsturmführer, or Captain, and finally to SS Sturmbahnführer, or Major, in June 1943. The following month, after Hitler had been shown colour footage of a V-2 successfully lifting off, he personally appointed von Braun to a professorship. Dr. Arthur Rudolph, leading the effort to develop the V-2 as a weapon to bombard London, and later a senior NASA official, personally approved of Kammler's use of slave labour to manufacture the weapons at the Mittelwerk underground factory. Von Braun himself visited the plant many times and saw for himself the conditions these slaves were labouring under, and he admitted that by 1944 deaths were indeed occurring. Some witness testimonies allege that von Braun was much more hands-on during his visits to Mittelwerk, and was seen to walk impassionately past piles of dead workers who had either died from overwork or been executed as part of the punishment process the SS had in place. Whatever the truth, von Braun tried post-war to excuse his part in the killings, saying that he knew what was going on but felt powerless to help change the situation. Many other men who had engaged in production using slave labour, but who lacked von Braun's special scientific and technical skill base, would be placed on trial for their crimes, for having knowingly utilised such labour in the course of their work. Von Braun was not only promoted by the Nazis, but he was also honoured by them. He received the War Merit Cross, first class with swords, and later the very rare Knight's Cross of the War Merit Cross with swords. Von Braun and his buddies turned themselves over to the U.S. Army in May 1945, knowing their value, and also giving the Americans 14 tons of V-2 technical materials and documents, which, accompanied by the V-2 missiles that the Americans captured, enabled the Americans to advance its own nuclear missile and space programs immeasurably. Von Braun and his team of Nazis would work at Huntsville, Alabama for 20 years. He led the Army's development of the Redstone rocket. As director of the Operations Division of the Army Ballistic Missile Agency, von Braun and his team developed Jupiter C, the basis for the Juno 1 rocket that successfully launched the West's first satellite, Explorer 1, in June 1958, beginning the U.S. space program. Uh, a project like uh, firing a satellite into orbit is uh, only possible if there's splendid teamwork all the way through. In this particular case, this teamwork involved, at first, close cooperation between our own Army Ballistic Missile Agency in Huntsville, Alabama, and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. Between the two of us, the vehicle was developed uh, that carried the satellite into orbit. Always interested in human spaceflight and landing on the Moon and Mars, even in World War II. At NASA, von Braun was responsible for the Mercury Redstone rocket that put the first American in space, Alan Shepard, aboard Freedom 7, or Mercury Redstone 3, in May 1961. His team began work on the Apollo program and the Saturn rocket that would take man to the Moon, working closely with another old Nazi, Dr. Kurt Debus first director of the Kennedy Space Center. Debus had worked closely with von Braun at Peenemünde during the war as the V-Weapons Flight Director. A former Sturmabteilung, or SA man, from 1933, Debus had joined the Allgemeine SS in 1940 and was already a Nazi Party member. He was engineer in charge of the V-2 test facility. Like von Braun, Debus was intimately aware of the slave labour atrocities, but ignored the suffering to further his own research and the goal of Hitler and the Vengeance Weapons Programme. Debus himself worked for the British during Operation Backfire in October 1945 before hastily transferring to Texas under Operation Paperclip. 
Debus directed the design, development, and the construction of NASA's Saturn launch facility at Cape Canaveral and Merritt Island. He was the first director of the Kennedy Space Center and was involved with Apollo and Skylab before retiring. To say that von Braun and Debus's work was appreciated by their new masters was a vast understatement. They were showered with honours, von Braun among many honours, given the National Medal of Science in 1975, and Debus received twice the NASA Distinguished Service Medal and the Exceptional Civilian Medal from the US Army. So it is not surprising that both men were widely honoured in other ways, and despite their Nazi pasts and their involvement in the Holocaust, remain honoured to this day. The Redstone Arsenal contains the von Braun complex, used by the Missile Defense Agency, which also contains a memorial to von Braun. The U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Alabama has information boards praising von Braun in a positive light, including a massive quote from him towering over one floor. The city of Huntsville also has the von Braun Center, which contains sports facilities and a concert hall. Additionally, Huntsville also has the Von Braun Drive Northwest, a road named in his honor. The University of Alabama at Huntsville has the Werner Von Braun Research Hall and a bust and two plaques on campus. No mention is made of Von Braun's Nazi past or the slave labor. Huntsville's Monte Seno State Park contains the Werner Von Braun Planetarium owned by the Von Braun Astronomical Society, on land owned by the Alabama State Parks Division. A plaque honoring Von Braun, who is termed on the plaque a German immigrant, can be found at Alabama Men's Hall of Fame in Birmingham. Dr. Debus is similarly memorialized. The Kennedy Space Center has the Dr. Kurt H. Debus Conference Facility. Debus's NASA biography doesn't actually mention his Nazi past nor his SS membership, despite Debus wearing his SS officer's uniform daily, according to witnesses, whilst working on the V2 project. The Debus Conference Facility hands out the Dr. Kurt H. Debus Memorial Award on behalf of the National Space Club Florida Committee. Make what you will of this information that I've given you. Perhaps the brilliance of both von Braun, Debus, and the other 1,600 paperclip scientists and technicians, and what they achieve for the United States, outweighs the piles of dead bodies in Germany. Perhaps you think that honouring such men, regardless of their talents, is crass and insensitive today. Either way, let me know in the comments section below. And incidentally, von Braun and Debus are not the only fully paid up Nazis and former SS officers proudly honored by the United States today, but they are perhaps the most famous. Many thanks for watching, please subscribe and share, and also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon, details in the description box below.